All right, then. Then we'll get started. Um, so the next section of the course uh, that I usually teach is metaethics. Now, metaethics, if you notice for the chapters for this week, Metaethics, I'm starting with chapter 19 in the Fundamentals of Ethics, which is the back of the book. And so I know that people would probably say, well, wait a minute, why are we starting with the back of the book? There's good reason why. There's, there's a method to my madness. Um, Metaethics is really the foundation for all of ethics. So in order to st understand ethics, you're going to have to understand well, what metaethics is about. And I talk about a particular case study that Schaefer Landau discusses in the book. So there's this particular case study of an honor killing. Is anybody familiar with what an honor killing is? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. So here, this father thought that it was best uh, to restore honor because of the circumstances with his daughter, right? And that talks about how um, this is a case in Turkey that a 14-year-old girl was on her way uh, back from the, from the market and she was abducted and raped by a group of men. And she was held captive for some days. And notice what uh, I found the original newspaper article that was referenced in the book it says that Nuran was abducted in Istanbul on her way back from a trip to the supermarket and raped over six days. She was rescued by police and returned to her family. Her father, once she was returned to her family, told police that he and other relatives took to go to the aunt's home where he strangled her, ignoring her pleas and her cries. And he said, I did it. Um, he said, I decided to kill her because her honor was dirtied. He said, I didn't listen because, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't listen to her pleas. I wrapped a wire around her neck and pulled it until she died. So the father's reasoning here is that in order to restore honor to the family, because she's been violated, the only thing to do is to kill her. So for us, and when we're talking about with these chapters, and this is where we started getting into some real ethics, can we say what the father actions are right or wrong? Did what the father do, was that a wrong action? Yes, for me, yes, that's what they do. Can we say objectively that it's wrong? Yes. For some philosophers, they will say yes. And this is where we're getting into. This is where we get into metaethics. So what metaethics is, and this is why I said I, I started at the beginning, if you look at the map. If it's the foundation, it's usually referred to with the prefix meta, meaning beyond. So it means beyond ethics. What does that mean? It means that you're taking a step back from ethics itself and examining it from the outside. So in order to say, well, this was right, this was wrong, this is, you know, bad, this is good. You first have to determine, well, wait a minute. Is there a such thing as bad and good? Is there such a thing as right or wrong? And how do we, where's this standard of right and wrong? What are, the, what are these values that we say exist? And this is what metaethics is about. We're taking a step back and saying, well, wait a minute, is there even such a thing as right or wrong? So there's a number of different theories that we're gonna discuss. 
regarding metaethics. And you'll start to see that a lot of them have very different positions about what is right and what is wrong, what is good and what is bad, what their standards are very different. So you'll see objectivism and moral skepticism are the two main branches of metaethics. From there, skepticism takes different forms. There's ethical relativism, there's nihilism, and there's expressivism. And we'll get into the details of each. But for the main purpose of this section, the question you should ask yourself, are there moral objective standards or facts? Can there be a moral fact? Because this is where we come back to all the logic stuff that we were talking about before. Remember with logic, what did I say statements could be? What values can statements have when we talk about logic? Value or embodied? No, that was a structure. Oh. So I have a statement, you're an EPCC student, what could that be? What two values could that be? True or false? True or false, right. Mm -hmm. So here we're talking about, and we would say that's a fact. Here we're talking about moral facts. So instead of true or false, we're talking about can something be right or wrong? Or good or bad? So judging the particular father's actions, going back to that situation, can we say what the father did was right or wrong is the values. So that's the question. This is what philosophers are, and ethic, and particular ethicists are discussing is that, can we have an objective fact like right or wrong on the same level as true or false. So if it's an objective moral standard, then it's a standard that saying that it's going to go across the board independent of what people think, independent of people's opinions, say what the father did was wrong and it's a fact. That's what an objectivist would say. They say objectively that action was wrong. The skeptic is going to, of course, be skeptical about this. They're going to deny that. They're going to say that, wait a minute, you can't have an objective right or wrong. You can't, you can't say that what the father did was objectively wrong. So those are the two sort of sides of this debate. Does everybody follow along so far? Yes. Yeah. So if we look at the skeptic, and I said the skeptic has, there's different types of skepticism. There's ethical relativism. And ethical relativism splits into two as well. And ethical relativism is going to say, well, there is a right or wrong, there is a good or bad, but that right or wrong word of bad is relative to a particular either culture, that's a cultural relativist, or it's relative to a particular person, and that would be ethical subjectivism. So we, what we say in philosophy, we say the agent constructs the standard. And you'll see this term a lot in the class. Agent means that it is someone who is in control and responsible for their actions. So we're saying that an agent, somebody who's in control and responsible for their actions, they decide what is right or wrong. They create the standard. So if imagine if we had this list, you know, and we said, well, this is all the right things you can do. This is all the wrong things you can do. The skeptic 
is going to say, well, how do you make that list? Well, the subjective is going to say, well, everybody gets to make their own list. But that's different from the cultural relativist. The cultural relativist is going to say, no, 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 not every individual gets to make their own list. Their culture decides what's right or wrong. The culture makes the list. So going back to the, um, the example with the honor killing and the father, that's part of the issue. The ethical subjective is, is going to say that the father gets to decide what's right or wrong because he makes right or wrong. The cultural ethicist is going to say that, well, no, he didn't make right or wrong. His culture told him what's right or wrong. And he's just following. Questions? about those two differences because they're not the same don't get them mixed up no no now the nihilist is completely different the nihilist is going to argue that there are no facts at all that it's not even relative the nihilist coming from the word nil right? It means nothing. They're going to say there's no such thing as moral facts. So you can't even get it right or wrong because there's no, there's nothing there. There's no fact of the matter. It's all made up. And the expressive, this is along with the nihilists. They're going to say that, well, of course, every uh, morality is constructed. It's made up. It's not real. But what they disagree with the nihilists is that the expressive says, well, people aren't trying to talk about facts when they talk about morality. They're trying to talk about emotions. So when we say something is wrong, what we really mean is that I don't like it. It, make, it upsets me. And we'll go through each one. So starting with the subjectivist, remember the subjectivist is saying that right or wrong comes from the individual. They get to decide. They make the standard. But I want you to ask yourself, do you really think that it works that way? Do we get to decide or make up what's right or wrong? Or is it independent of what we think. Because go back to the father example, because the father thought that was the right thing to do, does that make it the right thing to do? No. But the subjectivist would say yes, right? They think that's how morality works. And that if I, if you said no, well then, then it's wrong for you, then that's how morality works too. So they're saying, well, it's right for him and it's wrong for you. But this is where we get into some serious deep debate. Can we say who is really correct here? No, because uh, the person is who made the standards, right? Of morality. According to the subjectivist, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. According to Yeah, they're going to say, well, they both are right, right? Each one makes yeah. standards. But this is where Schaefer Landau is going to start looking at that. So I'll give you the spoiler is that Schaefer Landau, the author of the textbook, he's an objectivist. He's a moral objectivist. He's going to say there is such a thing as an objective right or wrong. And that he disagrees with the subjectivist. But what he is, is he's also a very good philosopher because he's going to try to present both sides. So even though he believes one side over the other, he does want to show, okay, well, what are the arguments for either side? And you'll see this in the book a lot throughout the chapters, he's going to present uh, different sides of a debate. So 
he's thinking, well, why would somebody think that they're a subjectivist? Why would they say that? Well, it's just up to the person. And this is where, and I've had this, these discussions in real life as well. These are <laughs> like, these actually come up in real life um, with individuals I've, I've spoken to. Some will say that, well, but everyone has a right to their opinion. How can I, how can you tell, you know, the father that he was right or wrong? Doesn't everybody have a right to an opinion? And this is where we get into the argument. So this is why I spent all that time with the logic stuff, because I said there's going to be a lot of arguments in this book. So in chapter 21, there is an argument from equal rights. And we'll go through that right now. So the subjectivist might say, well, if everyone has an equal right to an opinion, then all opinions must be equally plausible. So if everyone has an equal right to everybody's his or her own opinion, then everybody could be right. And the second premise is going to say, well, of course everybody has his or her has their equal right to an opinion. So therefore, all moral opinions are plausible. So notice what's going on with the argument. Remember I talked about those indicator words, the operators? There's if, right? There's then, there's all. So you see how all that's coming together in these arguments. So there's a flow, there's a structure to it, right? And what's the conclusion here? Or, or therefore all moral opinions are equally possible. Right. So they're using one and two to get to three. But they're also going to say, if all moral opinions are equally plausible, if three is true, then objectivism is going to be false. You can't have an objective right or wrong. Therefore, they want to conclude then, well, if of course, ethical objectivism is false. So this is an argument against objectivism from the subjectivist view. So we have two conclusions. How many arguments do we have then? Three. Oh, arguments. Yeah. I say... Remember the rule I said about uh, arguments and conclusions? One conclusion per argument. So if you have two conclusions, how many arguments? Two. Two, right? Because it's two yeah. conclusions and it's two arguments. So in order to get to five, which is our second conclusion, they would have to prove three first, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now think about it for a second. Does one and two prove three? Yes. How? How do we know if it proves three or not? So remember what I said about how you take apart an argument, how do you see if it's a good argument or not? We look at the premises, right? To see if they're true. Mm -hmm. So we look at the statements and we also look at the structure. Mm -hmm. So I'll save you the time. The structure is fine. This is where I said Philando is such a good philosopher. He's going to, he's not going to like present the other side's arguing with a bad structure. He, he wants to give them the best chance that he can. So he said, okay, I'll give you a good structure, but let's see if what you're saying is actually true or false. Right? Mm -hmm. So then take 
the situation here. If everyone has equal right to an opinion, then all opinions are equally plausible. Everyone has an equal right to his or her moral opinion. So let's start with two, because two is also repeated in one, right? Uh -huh. Using the if and then. So is it true that is two true? Everyone has an equal right to his or her moral opinion. Yes. Okay. Now let's go to one. If that's true, everyone has an equal right to an opinion. Does that mean all opinions are equally plausible? Does that mean that the second part is true? After the then. No. No. Good. That's the issue. Just because you can say that everyone has an equal right to an opinion doesn't mean everybody is right about their yeah. opinion. Mm -hmm. So if the first part is true, but the second part is false, then what is the whole sentence? True or false? False. And that's where the argument falls apart. So if they can't argue that number one is true, then you can't really get to the conclusion for three, right? Yes. And that means that you can't get to the conclusion for the second argument, five, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the issue here. And this is why, totally, he's a good philosopher. He's showing us that just because everybody has a right to an opinion doesn't mean everybody is right about their opinion. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't, that just because everybody has a right about their opinion doesn't prove that there is no objective right or wrong. And so as a good philosopher, he's going to also anticipate what the other side's going to say. So how would the subjectivist come back and say, well, wait a minute, they still believe that right or wrong is up to the person. So they might say, well, yeah, but everyone has different moral beliefs. Everybody has a different idea of right or wrong. No, like, it seems like a lot of people disagree about what is right or wrong. So how can you say what's right or wrong if everybody disagrees about it, right? Yeah. This is the argument for disagreement, also in chapter 21. I'm going to say that, well, let's take that situation. If well-informed, open-minded, rational people disagree, and notice the words he's using here, well-informed, open-minded, rational people, right? He's not saying that, oh, well, they just don't know or anything. He's saying, no, take people who are well-informed, they know what's going on, they're open-minded, they're not, you know, trying to dismiss it right away. Say, okay, but let's say these open-minded people disagree about what is right or what is wrong, then that claim cannot be objectively true because they disagree. And you say, well, it's true that you'll find people who disagree, right? Mm -hmm. Therefore, no moral claim can be true. But what's wrong with this argument? He's gonna show us there's a problem with this kind of reasoning. Because can they go from one and two to three? Does one and two get them to three? Remember, break it down like we did in the previous example. Is too true that open-minded, rational people disagree about moral claims? Yes. 
okay? So you can find people that disagree. Let's go back to one. If that's true that people disagree, then does that mean that no claim can be objectively true? Because people disagree? Does that mean you can't no. objective truth? No. No. Good. So this is, again, what he's pointing out. When people will attempt to argue, the subjective is going to argue, well, people can't agree about right or wrong, so there is no such thing as right or wrong. Say, well, just because people disagree isn't proof that there is an objective answer. Mm -hmm. So premise one is the problem there, where they're trying to connect those two statements together, that people disagree, so then that means there's no answer. Because take it the same situation like in a math class, right? Just because you and your friend disagree about the answer doesn't mean, well, there's no answer to the problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So finally, like, how is the subjective is going to come back again from these damaging arguments? If I not suspect, well, this is actually the biggest problem maybe for subjectivism because then remember what the subjectivist is saying about right or wrong that every individual gets to decide so let's take two individuals let's say juan says abortion is wrong olivia says well abortion is not wrong so they disagree but the subjective is going to say, who's correct here? Juan or Olivia? Both, right. They're both right. But then you run into a problem because then what happens if we try to say both are correct? It's a contradiction. It's a contradiction, right. right. Yeah. The contradictions are always what? False. False. Right? This is why contradictions are bad, because they're always going to be false. So then, they can't both be correct, right? Or it's a contradiction. Mm -hmm. So how are you going to get out of this? And this is what Schaefer Lana anticipates, and this is what I have experienced firsthand as well. Some people will say, well then, um, how are we going to get out of this? Well, then we'll just say that We'll just agree to disagree. We'll say, well, Juan says he, is, he approves of it. He says, I approve of abortion. I disapprove, I'm sorry, I disapprove of abortion. And Olivia says, I don't disapprove, right? Mm -hmm. So there's not a contradiction anymore, but there's another problem going on. What's the, what's the other problem going on there? They got rid of the contradiction, but... Now there's a deeper problem. I think this happens a lot when people say they agree to disagree. What is the subject of this statement here where Juan is speaking? Abortion is wrong. What's the subject of this statement? Abortion? Ab abortion. They're talking about abortion, right? What is the subject of this statement down here where Juan says, I disapprove of abortion? What's the subject there? Is it their opinions? Their opinions, right, because what is Juan talking about in the second, in, in the second sentence? About what he thinks about abortion. Right. He's talking about himself. Yeah. So the subject is I. Mm -hmm. The subject is not about abortion anymore. He's talking about himself now. And this is the problem when you say, well, let's agree to disagree. They changed the subject. Mm -hmm. Before they were talking about abortion, now they're talking about themselves. But it doesn't solve the abortion problem. It's still there. But when we say, well, I agree to disagree, we're just 
avoiding the subject and talking about ourselves instead. And so you see how turning it into an opinion doesn't solve any of the problems, right? Yes. So I think this is, yeah, these are detrimental problems for the subjectivist. So for the subjectivist, if everyone is morally infallible, if everybody's right, no matter what they say, then you can't have a real disagreement. But then in order to say everyone's right, no matter what they say, and avoid being a contradiction, you're gonna to have to turn into an opinion, right? A matter of taste. And there's a very famous philosopher, uh, Gene Elston, saying that subjectivism was a cop-out though, because you're not really addressing the issue. You're just saying, well, everybody has a, their own opinion, forget about it. But you see how it's a complete avoidance of like moral responsibility no one's actually addressing the issue. We're just saying, well, it's an opinion. I don't want to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the problem that Sheriff Lama is trying to point out is that subjectivism leads you into that situation where you're not addressing real issues. You're just uh, avoiding them, basically. Mm -hmm. Now, the cultural approach is a little bit different, but you're going to see it runs into a lot of the same problems. The cultural approach is going to say that, well, instead of the person, and we can talk about the honor killing again, it's really the, the father's culture that tells him what's right or wrong. He's just following what his culture told him to. So we have different cultures and these different cultures have different ideas about what is correct and what is not. Now the cultural relativist is gonna say something very similar to the subjectivist in that, well, you can't really judge any of these cultures. They all have their own rules and standards. So the argument for cultural relativism is that people's judgments about right or wrong differ from culture to culture. And if that's true, well, then different cultures have different standards, then there's no objective standard or principle. And a principle here is a rule that you live by, right? Something that you live by, like a principle of like, you know, not to lie, not to steal. That's, that's some sort of rule, that's some sort of standard that you live by and you try to honor, right? Mm -hmm. So here they're saying, well, then there must be no objective principles. That's something that holds objectively for people. So then there can't be any objective principles because we have all these different cultures with different principles or different ideas about right or wrong. Now, if we examine this argument, let's go to one. Is it true that people's judgments about right or wrong differ from culture to culture? Yes. Yes. Right. Okay. Now, because people's judgments about wrong differ from culture to culture, does that mean that there are no objective principles? No. No. You see the problem here. Mm -hmm. Just because people have different ideas about right or wrong doesn't mean that there isn't a right or wrong answer. What sounds very familiar to the argument we just saw, right? Of disagreement. Mm -hmm. So the same problem is happening with the cultural approach. Just because people disagree between cultures doesn't prove that, well, there isn't an answer. And again, I emphasize like I've really had these debates in real life. 
like I've had talked to people and it's like, well, yeah, but how can you say all the different cultures have it's like, well, okay, but just because the different cultures disagree doesn't mean that there isn't an answer though. Mm -hmm. This is bad news for the flat earth people maybe, right? Because just because the flat earth people think the earth is flat doesn't mean that they're right. <laughs> you know, just yeah. So this is where Schaefer Lattin's gonna point out that disagreement alone doesn't prove anything, really. Just because people disagree about something doesn't prove that there is no answer or that there is an answer. It's just proves that people disagree, that's it. And people get mixed up, I think, in some sense of thinking that disagreement proves that there's no answer to the issue. So the cultural of his implications and problems here is that, again, like the subjectivists, everyone is morally valuable. All the cultures are right, no matter what they say. And that you can't really criticize them because they all get to make their own rules. But that's going to lead us to some problems. And this is where we get to Gensler's paper. So Harry Gensler is a philosopher and this is the reading in The Ethical Life. The reading from the other book. Mm -hmm. Gensler is going to argue against cultural relativism. He's an objectivist. He's going to say, there's a problem with this cultural relativist view of morality. Why? Because now this is something that I want to emphasize and I do this every semester. In order to understand his view, this is, I'm not making this up. This is what I was taught because this is going to be important, especially for the, um, for the applied response. The applied response is going to be about Gensler about his article. So I'm telling you ahead of time what the applied response is going to be about, the first one. I was taught, in order to really understand a philosophy article, you should be able to read it at least five times. Now that sounds like a lot, especially during this short semester. <laughs> it doesn't mean that you have to read it five times today. That's actually a bad idea, according to a lot of research in memory, where you try to cram and try to put everything in one day. More, more than likely, you're going to forget. <laughs> it actually works against you when you try to cram. So that's actually a general lesson for, for study. Like, do not try to cram and put everything in one day. More than likely, you'll forget most of it because our brains just don't work that way. How our brains do work, it seems, from the evidence is that if you repeat the same thing different days, like you take a little look at it again, a little, it sticks with you much better. So I would say space it out. Okay. Because the first, and why five times? The first time you read a philosophy article like uh, Gensler's article, It doesn't mean you're dumb if you don't understand what was going on in that paper. I read very complicated philosophy articles to this day, and I'm like, I don't know what they're talking about the first time I read it. And that's okay. Because the second time I read it, I come back to it again later, and I'll read it again. I start to see what's going on. And I was like, oh, okay, I kind of see what they're talking about here. And then the third time I read it, now I start to identify the structure because, <clears throat> excuse me, I've read it two times before. And then now I'm saying, oh, okay, they're going to start talking about this. And then in the middle, they talk about this and then they end off here. By the fourth time I read it, that's when I take a pencil. And if you're renting the books or whatever, and you don't want to mark up the book, just take a pencil where you can erase it. You've read it three times before. So now you have an idea where the important parts are, right? Mm -hmm. So 
just go to those paragraphs. Just go to those particular paragraphs. Put a little star or an asterisk or something. That's an important paragraph. I need to pay attention to that. So that the fifth time you read it, now you're ready to take notes. Now you're ready to highlight. Or again, if you are reading the book, you can buy those little sticky tabs, right? Those colored sticky tabs so you don't damage the book. Now you notice you don't have to read the whole thing all the way from the beginning, the fifth time, because you already penciled in the important parts, right? So now you go back to those important parts and you take notes, you put in your own words so you can remember. Because you'll see the articles that we're going to read from the real philosophers, they're not easy articles. <laughs> so I want to give, and that's why I spend all the time with logic and everything. Uh, they're not right away easy to read. It's not like reading social media stuff or anything. It's you really have to sit there and concentrate. Yeah. So what Genser's arguing here, essentially, what's wrong with cultural relativism, he makes four points, four objections against it. He's gonna say that relativism doesn't allow for consistent disagreement, meaning that remember the contradiction issue. If all the cultures are right, then no one's wrong, but then you run into contradictions. The second one is relativism is a four, very poor basis for defending tolerance. And this is a good example. Notice in the book, he refers to um, a young woman. Does anybody know her name? Let me get my copy here. So he talks about a young woman in, the, in his paper, this, this fictional woman, and her name is Ima. And her last name is Relativist. Which, if you put it together, it's I'm a Relativist, right? <laughs> Very terrible joke. But he says that this fictional person, I'm a, she's a cultural relativist. And why is she a cultural relativist? Because she's taken an anthropology course and she learned about different cultures in her class. And she spent some time abroad in Mexico and she saw a different culture. So she came back thinking, well, then different cultures have different ideas about right or wrong. And maybe there's no such thing as right or wrong. And she wants to respect all the cultures. She wants to be tolerant of all the cultures. So she's gonna say that, well, then the only way to be tolerant is to just accept all the cultures as right. Don't judge any culture. But we'll see what the problems with that is. And relativism is a council of conformity, number three, that relativism, in order to be a good cultural relativist, you're going to have to go along with and obey and conform with your culture. If your culture thinks this is right, well, then this is what you're going to have to do. And that for relativism is a poor advice in the world with many subcultures. So this is a, also a huge issue. Relativism, if you say the culture gets to decide what's right or wrong, the problem with that is that what happens if you belong to two different cultures and they say opposite things? Yeah. Which I think is especially relevant for us on the border, right? We have different cultures, the different ideas about what we should or should not do. If relativism just tells you follow your culture, well, like, well, I belong to a number of different cultures. Like, there's different rules that tell me different things. That doesn't really help me. Because, and we saw what was wrong with the first one, right? The, the contradictions. The tolerance one, is interesting because I'm a relativist. She thinks she's being tolerant by agreeing with everybody. 
and that's the only way to be truly tolerant, according to her. But Genser points out that if you're, if you see that view, that tolerance is only valuable if you accept everybody as right, everybody is equally plausible, then moral views of different people are not equally plausible if you're an objectivist, right? Because an objectivist is going to say, no, there is such a thing as a right or wrong answer. So then they're assuming that objectivism then must not be a very tolerant view. Like objectivists who say, like Schiffer Landau, that there is a definite right or wrong. Well, they're not tolerant. Then. There's a confusion here. Because what this fictional character is mistaking is that tolerance means that you have to believe what other people believe or you have to follow what other people follow. And that's actually not tolerance. Tolerance is merely like I tolerate my family. Maybe that's a good example. <laughs> like I tolerate my family. What I mean by that when I say I tolerate my family is not that I have to believe or follow what they say. To tolerate my family is just being to show them respect by being open-minded enough to listen to what they have to say. But it doesn't imply that I have to do what they say. So this is where the mistake is, is that tolerance is where I have to believe or go along with what people are saying. So actually, if you say that tolerance is something that all culture should be, like everybody should be tolerant, that's not a subjectivist or a relativist view. That's an objectivist view. Because you're saying objectively, regardless of what culture you're in, we should be tolerant for people. So there's no necessary connection between the two. To be a tolerant person doesn't mean you have to be a cultural relativist. Well, I think it's surprising for a lot of people. A lot of people don't realize that, that you don't have to believe where other people believe in order to tolerate them. You just have to hear them out. But that's it. You're not committed to anything else. And that's why I say I tolerate my family. I'll hear them out, but there's no way I have to agree with them. <laughs> and tolerance is actually the cultural relativist if they're trying to respect tolerance, it's gonna to run into a problem as well. And I think this is a really relevant issue right now that we're facing in the country. Because who is the cultural relativist is someone who's not going to judge what the culture is doing, right? they're not gonna take a position or a stance. And I bring this example up, but there's, I think, more recent examples right now within the news that uh, there was a controversy some years ago in, in Russia because they wanted to hold the Winter Olympics in Sochi, Russia. But uh, in Russia at the time, uh, they had passed some legislation, some laws that discriminated against homosexual people. So they made it okay to discriminate against homosexual people. Right. And some, and, and people were, wait a minute, how are you going to have the Olympics that's supposed to represent tolerance, right, for everybody in a country where they don't tolerate certain groups of people? And so there were a lot of protests about that. So there were protesters saying it was wrong, don't have the Winter Olympics in Russia. And then the, on the other side, you know, the government is 
taken a stance that it's okay to discriminate against homosexual people. The protesters are saying it's wrong. But who's the cultural relativist in this scenario? Who's taking the cultural relativist stance in this debate? Who's not taking a stance? The people who was protesting? No, they're taking a stance. They're saying it's wrong. Oh, oh okay, okay. But who's not taking a stance? Who's not saying it's wrong or right? They're not making any judgment. Notice what they're protesting. They're protesting against also not just the Russian government, but their corporations, the sponsors, right? Coca-Cola, Panasonic, right? Because they're giving money to support the Olympics. So they're paying for everything. I would say that the companies are the cultural relativists here. The companies are willing to work and give money to cultures that discriminate against people and cultures that don't. They're not making any judgment. They're willing to do business with anybody. They're the cultural relatives in this scenario. And this is why cultural relativism is not a good position if you believe in tolerance. They're willing to, to support tolerant groups and intolerant groups since they're not making a judgment and i think that's very relevant right now with what's going on right with the protests and everything if they're not if people are not taking a stance they're saying well you know i don't have a position i'm not taking a stance or you know we'll just let you know people do whatever they want to do. They're not taking any moral position about what's right or wrong. And that's actually a problem because they're allowing people to be intolerant as well as tolerant. To people, for people to be disrespectful and respectful, they're like, well, you know, just they're, it's a cop out again, I think you see how they're not really dealing with the issue. They're just like, well, they're just letting people do whatever and not taking a position or stand. Which I find interesting that a lot of people right now are um, very critical of protesters. Say, well, wait a minute, the protesters are taking a position, right? Mm -hmm. But they say, well, if you're not taking a position, then it's not really actually like, you're not taking a moral position, you're not taking a stance, then you are acting as a cultural relativist, I think. You say, well, I just go with whatever this culture does. Corporations have a long history of this problem that they're willing to do business with any type of people or any sort of moral, you know, rules or standards and not judge. It's, it's actually, in this case, it's, it's a bad thing that they're not making a judgment. Um, in particular, you know, uh, I'll give you an example real quick. You know that uh, s Holocaust survivors, that some of them have a tattoo of a number on their arm 
to designate what prisoner they were, right? Um, and so it's really sad and unfortunate, but, you know, these people have walked with this tattoo of this number on their arm for the rest of their lives. But why did they have a number there? How do you keep track of all these people? How did the Nazis keep track of all these people with these numbers? What do you need to keep track of that many people? Millions and millions of people. Another person to track with them? But if we're talking about six million Jewish people, right? Yeah. It's a big number. What do we use to keep track of big numbers? And I mean, what do we use today if I have to keep track of all the numbers of different people? Computer? Yeah. So in World War II, why they have those serial numbers there is because they were entering into one of the first computers and who made the these computers to keep track of all these prisoners was IBM. And notice what the, this is, you can Google this and, and find out the history about this. IBM knew what was going on in the concentration camps because at that time, no one knew how to fix a computer. So if something broke on the computer, they would have to send somebody from IBM into the concentration camp to fix the machine, right? Mm -hmm. So they had workers come in, go into the concentration camp, see all the dead bodies, see the torture, fix the machine, and then just leave. So they knew what was going on. They weren't like, oh, uh, we were for surprise. We didn't know what they were doing with our machines. They actually made the machine to keep track of people because computers were not a, you know, as common now. So I would say IBM is being the cultural optimist. They're not making any judgments. They're willing to do business with anybody. Yeah. They're not making a moral stance. And what happens when you try to make a moral stance? This is where we get to iconoclasts or social reformers. So an iconoclast or a social reformer is somebody who is going to reject the cultures, their culture standards or rules. They're going to resist. They don't agree with their culture about what their culture thinks is right or wrong. But if you're a cultural relativist and what are you going to say to that person? Who is right in this scenario? The person of the culture. According to the cultural relativist, who would they say is correct? The person or the culture? The culture. The culture, right? Yeah. So the person is always wrong if they disagree with their culture. One of my favorite iconoclasts or social reformers is the woman on the left. Does anybody recognize the woman on the left? Yes. Who is she? The, the woman in the left? Yeah. Why is she? she a good social reformer? Why is she a good iconoclast? What is she famous for? Because she's on money. I mean, she's kind of famous. Because in her time, the culture oppressed women. Right. So he, no, she, she, she had like, different ideas about women and rights of women, so. Right, exactly. She's, because it was a social reformer, like she's actually one of my favorite Mexican philosophers. Uh, there's a lot of good Mexican philosophers. She's one of my favorite Mexican philosophers. Uh, there's even, I saw on Netflix, if you guys are interested, there's a series that came out about her life. Oh, wow. uh, but she's really a great figure and uh, one of my favorite philosophers because she actually, this is, she lived in Mexico before it was Mexico, right? When it was still part of Spain, before yeah. the revolution. 
And so at that time, right, women didn't have a lot of options. So when she grew up, well, as a kid, right, she actually got into trouble because she wanted to read all the books in, in her family's library, but people discouraged her because women were not supposed to be educated. Like, there's no reason for them to read. So it's like, well, wait a minute. So, um, but she got, uh, if I remember correctly, she got a family friend to teach her how to read. And she read all the books in her, in her family's library. And she actually was a great logician. So all that logic stuff that we did, she would have aced that right away. Um, she's extremely smart, but the problem is, is that when she became of age, what options do women have at that time? What can they be or do in life when they become an adult? What are her options? What's common for women at the time? Oh. So, um, so at the time, right, like her options as a grown up are very limited. She can either be a wife, right? Mm -hmm. and have children but that means under Mexican culture whether she can continue to pursue philosophy or read or, or write would be up to the man right mm -hmm. that would be the husband's decision what she's allowed to do or what not right yeah and so that's one option. The other option which she took is to become a nun. And why in part she decided to become a nun is because there she could write, there she could continue to do philosophy. Mm -hmm. And she wrote a number of different really great pieces of philosophy. One in which got her in trouble with the Catholic Church because she pointed out is that well if we're all in God's children if we're all made in God's image and all God's children why are the priests why are men treated differently than women mm -hmm. which of course the the priests didn't like at all they got so upset <laughs> like she got <laughs> But notice this is where we're coming back to the cultural relativist part, is that the cultural relativist is going to say, well, she's wrong. She should just obey whatever her culture tells her to do. But the objectivist is going to say, well, no, like what her culture is telling her is wrong. So cultural relativism doesn't allow for people to reject or, or um, argue against their culture. Instead, it teaches you to conform. It tells you to just do whatever your culture says it's right or wrong, but not really to think for yourself. And the last, uh, well, we're almost there, but the second to last problem for cultural relativism is that it doesn't allow for more progress. These things, situations or things can't get better or worse in cultural relativism because they say, well, the culture is always right, no matter what time period. So if this is how they used to do it, well, that was right for them back then. And if they do it differently, well, it's right for them now. They're not going to, again, they're not going to make any judgments. But I would say that that is a problem, right? Just because that's how it was back then doesn't mean it was right. Mm -hmm. 
So you would see signs like this, right? But the cultural others would say, well, that's okay because that's what they believed back then. Where would you think you would see these kind of signs? Where in the United States where you would you think you, you they would have these kind of signs? What is the question? I'm sorry. Like the sign on the bottom. Uh huh. Where where would you think in the United States where are they where would they have these kind of signs posted? Where? Yeah, where? Why? Where? In restaurants or or what do you mean like? Yeah. So, uh, like, what location? Where where you, where would you think they would have these signs? In the door. How about downtown El Paso? Okay. So people forget about this. Mm -hmm. People don't forget that El Paso was this, was um, segregated. What? So uh, there are signs. If you look on, if you Google it up, you you'll find signs and images of like these kind of these kind of messages of like some restaurants they wouldn't serve. Oh, really? Yeah. Which apparently, apparently is coming back into fashion again, right? Yeah. Part of the debate now is that people again are thinking it's okay to discriminate against other people. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one of my former professors, he passed away a couple years ago, uh, but he would tell us, uh, he's much older, he would tell us that he would, one time he got arrested because he went with a friend of his who was a soldier at Fort Bliss, the soldier was black and they went to a downtown restaurant and they wouldn't serve them. And they called the police and they got arrested. Oh, wow. So cultural relativists are not going to say that it was right or wrong. They say, well, that's what the culture thought at the time. But an objective is going to say, well, it doesn't matter what time or, or culture to do that is always wrong. Mm -hmm. And then one of my favorite uh, other iconoclasts is a gentleman on the top. Um, his name is Rodolfo. Uh, his nickname is Corky Gonzalez. He's, does anybody know who he is? Are they familiar with him? No. Uh, he's, this is why I don't like the history department. <laughs> I don't know what they're teaching you in the history department. They should be teaching you this stuff. Um, <laughs> the Corey Gonzalez is, um, he's a civil rights uh, uh, advocate. And um, you guys are familiar with Cesar Chavez, right? Mm -hmm. Hopefully. <laughs> you guys are remember who Cesar Chavez. So he worked with Cesar Chavez a lot during the civil rights movement. Um, but he was seen as more extreme or, or um, in his views, uh, he was less of a pacifist. Uh, but he has a really interesting history because he's originally from Chihuahua, Chihuahua. And he was a boxer when he was younger. And I think he got injured. I have to check on this. He got injured and he relocated to Denver. And he became a poet and an activist, in part because he noticed that the, the schools in Denver, that they were segregated in a way where a lot of the white neighborhoods with the white uh, schools for children were, had, be had better resources, right? They had new books, new desks. 
in the neighborhoods that are predominantly black and Latino were, they didn't have new books. They didn't have new desks. Everything was beat up. Everything was kind of old, right? They weren't getting the same kind of funding. And so he was saying that that was wrong and he started protesting and advocating, you know? And again, the cultural relativist is not going to make a judgment. They're, again, they're not going to say, well, this is, it should be better or it's better now than it was before. But an objectivist would say that, no, clearly it is better than it was before. That you can make things objectively better in society. So, and then the last problem for the cultural relativist, I think, is the same problem that we solve with the subjectivist is that if they're gonna say all the cultures are right, no matter what they say, then you're gonna run into contradictions. But the only way out of the contradiction is that you make it an opinion. But again, you run back into the problem that the opinion doesn't solve the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So hopefully you see all the problems why cultural relativism is not a good theory for morality. Because merely put uh, right or wrong as a standard of a culture doesn't really help or solve many problems at all. So in general, I would say that this is that most, I'm going to say all, say most ethicists, metaphysicists, do not uh, accept relativism as a legit uh, form of ethics. To say that, well, people make up right or wrong or the culture gets to make up right or wrong because of all the problems that we talked about. It, the main one is probably the contradiction that it just doesn't make sense in the end. Mm -hmm. The real debate is between the nihilist, I would say, and the objectivist. Either there is an objective right or wrong or there isn't. But not that it depends on the culture of the person. So I think that's the real debate that's going on in, in a lot of ethics departments is, is that between those sides. Questions so far? No. So I know we're going through a lot and it's been a long time already. <laughs> um, are you guys able to hold on for um, the end of the metaethics to cover these two last theories? Nihilism and expressivism? Yeah. You guys hold on or are you guys going to break? or? <laughs> I'm good. Fine. Yeah, I'm fine. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll cover those two. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll post uh, the video up. And then um, trying to think of how best to cover the other material this week as well. I think uh, maybe the best thing to do, we're going to have to do a rescheduling because I was hoping just not be too demanding on everybody and just make Wednesdays a day, but I think we're going to need more days to cover all the material. Yeah, that's the much information. Yeah, so what we'll do then, I'm looking at the calendar here, uh, I'll hold the session tomorrow and on Friday as well to cover the other chapters. Okay. Week. It's just, I was hoping it would, but it's, yeah, just too much. I, that's why I prefer like face-to-face -face, uh, class. Yeah. We would meet every day and then, you know, but so. We'll so our meetings will be Wednesday, Tuesday, and Fridays? Um, or just for this week? For this week, I'll, I'll do it uh, Thursday and Friday as well. And then okay. I'm going to look at the schedule for next week and see 
what was going to work best, but probably more than one day, yeah, to cover all the material. Okay. I think it's tough because we have a number of different chapters going on. Okay. And what time? Like 11 or? Yeah, let's go for 11 because I think that was funny. Yeah. Okay. Everything's working out well on my computer and all that business. Okay. Um, okay, so hold on a second. Let me. Okay. So the last uh, two theories for skepticism are nihilism and expressivism. Now, the moral nihilist, they're very different from what we've seen so far. The nihilist is not going to say that morality is just based on a person or a culture. They're going to say, actually, it's all fantasy. And I try to make a good example or an analogy of uh, what they mean when they say that. So, so for example, uh, what do you see on the right side of the PowerPoint over here? Mm. A woman? So everybody would agree that they see a woman? Does everybody see anything else? I mean, some people have told me they see a guy playing a saxophone. Yeah, that's what I Oh, think. yeah. So what is it? Is, it? is it a woman or is it a guy playing a saxophone? Both. <laughs> I would say neither. It's really just a bunch of black and white pixels on a screen. Notice what you did. You put the woman's face there. You put the guy playing the saxophone there. But really what's going on is just a bunch of black and white dots. Mm. This is a phenomenon in psychology you'll see a lot where we start to see things that aren't really there. Like we start to make up the, the images. Uh, this is why if you see a scary movie, and then at night, you think there's like faces in the dark or you start seeing things, right? Yeah. <laughs> our, our psychology, the way our brain works is that we're very good at recognizing faces. Like that's how part of our development is that we look for a person's eyes and nose and that's how we recognize people, right? It's really important for us. The problem is, is that we start seeing faces where there are no faces. And we start looking for eyes and nose and mouth when there is no eyes, nose, or mouth. And so this is why also maybe some people see like Jesus and tortillas or something. Like, you know, like we, we, we try to make the face, we try to look at the image and then, and then we place it there, right? Not that it's actually there. Yeah. And that's what essentially saying, in a sense that like the nihilist is doing the nihilist is saying that we do that except with morality, with right or wrong. That there is no fact about right or wrong. We put it there. We make it. We say, we point to something and say, oh, that's wrong. But it's like seeing a face where there is no face. We're constructing that. So one of the most famous moral nihilist is J.L. Mackey. J.L. Mackey is a, um, is a really important philosopher of the 20th century. And in his paper, and this is the other reading from The Ethical Life, is The Subjectivity of Values by Mackey. He's arguing in this paper, his thesis is that there are no objective values. There's no such thing as an objective right or wrong or good or bad. Now, as a nihilist, I want to clarify. A moral analysis is not saying there's no such thing as true or false. Where they disagree is to say that there's such thing as right or wrong. So remember, I want to go back for a second. Let me see if I can show you guys first.
We'll go back to that part. So, see if it will let me draw it. So you remember when we had a statement and the statement was like, let's say P and P was either true or false. Mm -hmm. And then I said moral statements are a little bit different because moral statements would be not true or false, but maybe right or wrong, or let's say um, good or bad. Those are, those are moral values. Mm -hmm. So the moral now is the same. No, they're fine with true and false, but they reject right or wrong or good or bad. That those can't be facts. And so for then, for then, there is no right and wrong, just true and false, right? Right. Okay. Why do they are saying that? Let me come back to the. Is that Mackie's going to say that these values are not objective? These can be objective, the true and false, but the right and wrong can't be objective, or the good or bad can't be objective. They actually don't exist. Why is he saying that? Because he's saying that as a nihilist, our moral language presupposes the existence of objective moral values. What he means by that is that when I say abortion is wrong, when I make that statement, it sounds like I'm talking about something real because of our language. Now, he doesn't disagree with the abortion part. Like, you can point to an abortion and say, okay, there's the procedure. It's true that this person's having an abortion, right? Mm -hmm. Where his problem is, is that, um, well, the problem is, is that the, my computer's giving me, is that, the abortion, the physical act is, is true, but when you say it's wrong, that is you adding to it, like adding the face there when there is no face. Does that make sense? Yeah, for then morality is not real, right? Yeah. but. But the way our language is, it sounds like it's real. Because we say it like it is a fact. We say, oh, the abortion is wrong. Mm -hmm. So it sounds to us like we're talking about it as a fact when it's really not a fact. This is why he calls it error theory. We're making an error in our judgments. We, we're making a mistake. We think we're talking about facts when we're not. So he's essentially what he's saying is that the epistemology doesn't line up with the metaphysics. And these words are really particular to philosophy, really important to philosophy. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. That's where, that's actually the biggest field I think right now in philosophy is epistemology. Some philosophers will just work in that area where we investigate what constitutes knowledge itself. When can you say you know something? When can you say you're justified? When is it a fact or not? Those are discussions that we have. Metaphysics, and this is my favorite and this is where I spend a lot of time with, metaphysics is about reality itself. What is reality? What can exist and what cannot exist? what's possible in reality and what is not. Those are deep discussions that we have in metaphysics. So why this is important here is that Mackey is saying that the epistemology, what we know or what we claim to know, 
I claim to know that abortion is wrong doesn't really line up with the metaphysics, doesn't line up with reality. Because in reality, there is no right or wrong. So you see how we're trying to think we know something, some fact about morality when in reality it's not, there's nothing there. Does that make you fall so far? So that's where he says the problem is, is we think we know stuff about stuff that doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. And this is what he calls in the book, first order versus second order judgments. First order judgments are the type of judgments you have about particular situations. Like, is abortion right or wrong? That's a particular topic, right? Second order judgments are higher level judgments. Second order judgments are about, well, is there a right or wrong in the first place? Excuse me, how can I judge abortion if there's not even a right or wrong to begin with? So look how clever Mackey is. Mackey is going to argue if he can disprove that there is no such thing as right or wrong, does he have to worry about debating about a, whether abortion is right or wrong? No, right? If no. there's no such thing as right or wrong, then why even worry about whether abortion is right or wrong? Actually, if he's really correct that there are no objective values, that means the rest of this class is useless. Like everything you'll be learning is a fantasy. So it has really deep implications. It's really important to have this debate because it establishes, this is why I started here with the back of the book. It's the foundation. What is the foundation of ethics? Is it based on facts or not? And how is he going to argue against the idea that uh, morality is about facts? He has two arguments in the book. The argument from relativity is the first one. In it, he's going to say that, how, he, he wants to answer this question. How do you explain that there are so many differences in moral codes of different societies? So all these different cultures, they all have their different rules about right or wrong. And if morality is objective, then why don't all societies share the moral code? Like, if it's truly objective, then why didn't we all come to the consensus that like, well, it's wrong? Why doesn't everybody just agree? if it's a real fact, right? He's gonna say that moral codes are not objective, but they're rather reflections of a way of life. His example is that it is that people approve of monogamy. So monogamy being with one person, right? In a relationship. So, why do people think that's right? Why do they approve of monogamy? Because they participate in a monogamous way of life, because that's the way they live. Rather than that they participate in a monogamous way of life because they approve of monogamy. So notice what he's saying here. Why do we think monogamy is okay or is it right? It's not because we were told it's right, it's because that's what we do and that's how we live. And then we make it right. Or we make it a rule to say that that's the right way to live. So this is, has deep implications because he's saying how, like, how do we get these rules of morality? How do we get these ideas of right or wrong? that they're really a reflection of a way of life, meaning that that's how that culture or group of people decided to live 
And then they made a rule out of that. And that's why you have all these different rules. So notice his explanation. He says, it doesn't have to be objective. There's nothing uh, really objective about this. It's just what people do. He's just describing, well, that's how people live. This is how we came up with these rules. And we just forget about how we develop these rules, I guess, through time and they become a part of our tradition and we don't even remember or realize why we think they're right or wrong. So I'll give you a quick example, like why do some cultures in history uh, are more repressive about homosexuality than others? It depends on the circumstances. So like uh, one theory that's, that's been proposed is this, is that, or hypothesis is that why in Christianity, why is homosexuality has a tradition of being looked down upon or that it's, that it's immoral, it's wrong. Um, if you imagine the Israelites, right, is a small community of people who are nomadic and they're in the desert and we live in the desert, right? Do we have a lot of resources like water and food? No. No, it, it's very crucial that we need to use everything that we have to survive. So it's been hypothesized or proposed that the reason why maybe a Judeo-Christian belief is that home, part of like that tradition, maybe it come from the situation is that since it's a small group of people and their resources are very limited, people engaging in homosexual uh, relationships, they saw it as a waste of energy, a waste of resources, because they're not going to produce babies. You see? Yeah. But if you look around at the same time in history, at larger civilizations, like the Greeks, Egyptians, later Romans, their views of homosexuality are really different sometimes, and it doesn't seem like a big issue to them. And part of the proposal is that because they have enough people, like if people decide to engage in homosexual relationships and they don't have children, it's not a big issue because there's, those civilizations are large. There's plenty of people to still go to work, to still make the civilization run. It doesn't really affect the civilization. So that's like a very anthropological, down-to-earth explanation of like, it's not that God said it was wrong or, or some supernatural thing. It's just really, well, that's because it made sense to them because they didn't have a lot of resources versus other cultures that had more, way more resources. And so you see how he's explaining where we get morality from. It's like, it's probably something simple like that. It's not this complicated supernatural thing. It's just probably very straightforward scientific explanation. I mean, this just happens a lot with tradition, right? Like in some cultures, uh, if I remember correctly, it's, it's impolite to serve food with your left hand. So if you went to a restaurant and the server gave you food with their left hand, it would be actually very rude, disrespectful. So how do you think that tradition started? Why do they think that that's a bad thing, your left hand, serving with your left hand? Because it will be they use the left hand when go to the restaurant or something like that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it, it, exactly. But the thing is, I, it made sense at the time, maybe before we understood about germs and disinfected, right? Mm -hmm. That they just noticed that maybe people got sick when they were served with somebody's left hand. And, but they didn't really, they don't understand anything about germs, right? So 
but they made it kind of a general rule or tradition, don't serve with your left hand. So even of course, now that we have soap and disinfected and you know, hopefully we're washing our hands, uh, like it's not as important what hand you use, right? But it kind of gets caught up in the tradition and the culture that now it's just kind of normal and then that's just the way, you know, what's polite and what's not. Yeah. And that's what Mackie is saying, essentially, maybe that's how morality comes about. It's just that it starts off some, for some very practical reason and then it turns out into some tradition and then we don't even remember why we think it's right or wrong. Mm -hmm. I mean, can everybody tell me like, why if we if you eat a cake and you find a plastic baby inside, you have to throw a party? Does everybody know the origins of that tradition? No. But we do it anyways, right? <laughs> <laughs> we do it, right? We go, we, we go with it and we don't even know why anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying about morality is that it's probably works that way. We, we started somewhere, it becomes a tradition, we don't even remember why. And so he gave you a very straightforward explanation. Now, this is why he's an excellent philosopher. He has a second argument and he's going to say, okay, I explained to you where morality comes from probably from these traditions that we don't remember the origin, right? But for very practical reasons. But now he's going to play the devil's advocate. He's going to turn it on the other side. He's going to say, okay, but if you think morality is objective, that it's really a fact, then he's going to say, well, how does that work then? You explained to me, I gave you my version. Now you explain your version. He says, if there are objective moral facts, values, or standards in the universe, and he says, then they would be entities or qualities or relations of very strange, queer sort, utterly different from anything else in the universe. Notice what he's saying here. If there's a fact about right or wrong, then he's going to say it doesn't seem to match up with anything else we know in the universe or can study. They would be entities, qualities, or relations of a very strange sort. This is where it gets to some deep metaphysics, metaphysics. Because when, remember I said metaphysics is about reality. So how do I know something exists or not, right? Um, like, let's say this drink I have, it has a weight, right? You can see it, you can measure it. So it has all these properties, right? I can put it in front of me, I can put it behind me as a location. So that's what he's talking about. He says, well, okay, but let's talk about right or wrong. Can you see right or wrong with your eyes? No. Can you measure it? Can you weigh it? No. Can you put it in front of you, behind you? No. Then he's saying, then how does it exist? Like, that's really weird, right? Because you're telling me that it's real, but it doesn't match up with anything else that we know is real. And then he's going to take it a step further. But if you swear that it's right or that it's or it's, that it's wrong, like let's say somebody says, "No, I know abortion is wrong." Maybe you can't see it with your eyes, but I just know it's wrong. Then he's going to say, "Okay," but then you must have some sort of special faculty of moral perception or intuition, utterly different from our ordinary ways of knowing everything else. So essentially, what he's saying there is that then you must have some special power that you know you can see right or wrong and you don't have to use your regular eyes to see. Notice what he's saying. This is kind of weird. <laughs> like, imagine, right? Somebody's telling you, oh, I know it exists, but you can't see it and you can't move and you can't touch it. It's like, well, how do you, how do you know it's there? Because I just feel it. <laughs> and it's like that sounds really weird like you have a really weird universe going on here yeah and see how clever he is then he said okay 
I gave my explanation for I get right and wrong from. Now let's hear your explanation. So what sounds more reasonable? The first one. Right. Yeah. And this is why he's saying that what explains then this mass delusion? Why would, and he calls it a mass delusion, like why would all these people believe in something that doesn't exist and follow all these rules that aren't real? Like, why would we talk about it and, and speak about it and act like it's real when it's not? He's going to say it's social pressure is one part of it. That if you grew up in a culture or society and they keep telling you from a very early age that it's wrong, well, then you're going to believe and act like it's wrong. And that the people who are telling you this, you're going to believe them because they're an authority. They're the objective. They're, notice what he says, primarily through education. Growing up, whatever your parents taught you, whatever your school taught you, is what you end up believing as real. And that the same thing works with aesthetics. Aesthetics is the, is, the, uh, is the discipline in philosophy talking about beauty, what is beautiful, what is not. And he says, well, most of us kind of accept that aesthetics, what is beautiful, what is ugly is kind of very uh, subjective thing. But he's saying right or wrong is like the same thing as aesthetic values. It's just that why do we treat one more important than the other? Because we take ethical issues more seriously than aesthetic issues. But he says there's no difference between them. They're both made up. They're both fabricated. Does everybody follow along so far? Yes. Yeah. Now, expressiveness is slightly different. Expressiveness are going to say that they agree with the nihilist that, of course, there's no such thing in the world as right or wrong, that you can't really make true judgments or facts because it doesn't exist. Where they disagree, is in three. Mackey thought that people really, when they said something was wrong, they really sincerely believed that that was a fact. The expressivist is going to say no. They're not expressing facts. That's not what they're trying to do. They're expressing emotions. That it's, that's where the nihilist is wrong is that they don't understand that people are really just expressing emotions when they say something is wrong, not that they're trying to get a fact. But why would people do that? Why would people express these emotions if it's not about something that's actually true? Why would they tell people that it's right or wrong when there is no such thing as right or wrong, when it's just really expressing their emotions. Why would they go through all that pro trouble?
Have you ever ate something or tasted something and then you're like, oh God, that tastes terrible. And then you go to your friend and you say, hey, taste this. <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> If you taste it terrible, why would you say, oh, God, this is awful, taste it? Why would you do that to your friend? To see his reaction? Or to laugh? Maybe. His reaction? Because you will, I don't know. What the expressive is kind of saying is that you want that person to feel what you're feeling. If you're grossed out by it, then you want them to be grossed out by it. So I'll give you, this is an actual, I preference this, this is an actual example in philosophy. It was written by a philosopher. I'm not making this up, but this is an actual example. So this one philosopher proposes this. Let's say that a, that a, that a man goes to the supermarket, right? And he buys uh, a frozen chicken, okay? Mm -hmm. Takes it home, he thaws it out, right? Mm -hmm. He has sex with the dead chicken. He ejaculates in the chicken. He puts it in the oven, he cooks it, and then he eats it. See, I didn't make this up. Like, this is an actual example from a real from philosopher. Okay. Did he do anything morally wrong? In the point of view of the expressive expressivism? No, in any way. Can we in, say in general? Yeah. Can we say he did anything wrong? No. But do you see, this is what the expression is saying. But we would think, people say, oh, God, that's just wrong. Yeah. Because it grosses us out. It's an emotional reaction. What the expression is saying is that we label things right or wrong because how we feel about it emotionally. So there's not anything actually wrong with what the guy did. It's just that it grosses us out. So we're going to say it's wrong. Mm -hmm. We're going to place a judgment that it's wrong. And it's, I think the, the reason why this philosopher gave that example is that it seems kind of like, okay, more sh easier to understand about the chicken thing. But when we talk about abortion or something, they're saying the same thing happens too. It's not that abortion is actually wrong. It just grosses us out. So people who say it's wrong is, is because they don't like how it makes them feel. Not that it's actually wrong. They're saying that it's just how they feel. But we label it as wrong. So that's essentially what the expressive is saying that we just label stuff based on our emotional reaction they would explain a lot of behavior that way they would explain um homosexuality in the same way that people who think homosexuality is wrong is just because it disgusts them not that it's actually wrong excuse me i don't know whose alarm is going off you guys can hear that <laughs> it's okay um, um but that's what they're saying essentially is that like when we say abortion, homosexuality, all these ethical issues, they're really just how people feel about it and not that it's an actual fact. 
Now that sounds reasonable, except yeah. there's a problem that Schiffer Lionel is going to point out. He's going to say that, wait a minute, what about the amoralist? What about somebody who really sincerely, they're not lying to you, they sincerely say that, oh, no, it's wrong, but they do it anyways. How can the expressiveness explain somebody who really believes it's wrong, but that doesn't stop them from doing it? Why is that a problem for the expressivist? Why would that be an issue for somebody who's like that? What's not making sense? Think about what the expressive is saying. They're saying that emotions reflect what we do, right? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, I'm sorry, what we do is reflects our emotions. But if this is true, then you can find somebody who believes one way, but they act a different way. Then their, um, then their actions don't really reflect their emotions, right? Mm -hmm. This is why they... The, Feelings are supposed to motivate us to do things. So why somebody's going to protest against abortion because they feel that way. But this is saying that, well, they feel one way, but that doesn't mean they're going to protest. So this is something that's really important and I want everybody here to remember. There's a difference between somebody's intentions versus the consequences of their action. They're not related. This is really hard for people to understand sometimes. That what people's intentions are don't always line up with what they do. So this is why we call, because remember I said philosophy, we're very particular about the words. This is why we call intentions praise or blameworthy those are the values we'll give it. And consequences is good or bad. Why we don't call them the same, good or bad, is because intentions, I can have praiseworthy intentions. Let's say I'm trying to help somebody out. But when I try to help them out, I end up making it worse. Those are the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see how even though I had something that you would praise me for, my intentions, doesn't mean that it's going to come out good. And, and the same the other way around. Maybe I try to hurt somebody and I end up helping them. Like it backfires, right? Like I try to get them fired and then I end up like getting them a promotion or something. Mm -hmm. Do you see how like it doesn't always match? Mm -hmm. For the expressiveness, it was supposed to match all the time and saying, well, this is how you feel and this is what's gonna, what you're gonna do. But that's not how it really works. And I think this is why it's confusing for people, right? Um, I think parents are a good example of this. I think parents want the best for their children. They might have praiseworthy intentions, but sometimes your parents make it worse, <laughs> you know, for what they do. And that's the confusion, right? It's, it's like, I thought I was trying to do or trying to help you and then actually hurt you. So this is a problem for the expressivists. They don't have a good explanation for that. That's why I think really the debate is between the objectivist and the nihilist. 
either there are facts or there are not facts about morality. And the objective is, is going to say, it has to be, they're not denying that there are feelings. They're just saying, there's got to be more than just feelings here. So what's going on in these photos, people being tortured, that's not just about how we feel. There's actually some real moral issue here. And this is why expressivists, if they just reduce it down to feelings, it doesn't explain everything. The objective is going to say, no, the whole abortion debate is actually about a real issue and not just about feelings. And the nihilists, even though they want to say there's no such thing as right or wrong, the objective is going to argue, but there are clear situations where something is right or wrong, regardless of whether we believe it or not. Now, there's a whole list of arguments in chapter 21 where Schaefer Lano is going to try to give the objectivist perspective. And I know we're running a lot on time here. I don't want to go through every single one. Uh, the ones in red, we actually already went through. Mm -hmm. Some of them are important. There's actually 11 arguments, but I want to hold. I held off on talking about all 11 as well because some of those arguments we haven't gotten into the parts of the book yet, so they don't quite make sense. So that's why I haven't addressed them yet. These eight arguments are, you should go over. We went over three, five, and six. Some of these other arguments are relevant too, but I think the one that I really want to focus on and end off with is argument eight. Values have no place in the scientific world. I think that's really where uh, we should discuss and probably the most, more important argument. And this is essentially, going back to Mackey, what Mackey's debate was, his issue was, is that he was saying that you can't see right or wrong, you can't test it with science, so why should we believe something that science can't prove? And so the argument goes this way. If science can verify the existence of X, like whatever you want, then the best evidence tells us, well, that it doesn't exist, right? And science can't verify the existence of objective moral values, so right or wrong and good and bad. Therefore, the best evidence tells us, well, that these don't exist. But remember, Schaefer Landau is an objectivist, so he's going to argue back. What is he going to point out is flawed in this argument? Why is this argument a good argument? Think about this for a second. If science can verify X, like they can get evidence for X, can you say then it doesn't exist? No. Right. That's the issue here. The problem is that move according to Schaefer Lano, just because science can demonstrate the existence of something doesn't mean that it's not objective. I'll give you a, an example. Science uses what other discipline in order to do science? What other discipline do you need in order to do science that we, ta that we talked about when we talked about logic? Yeah. 
scientific method? But before the scientific method, in order to measure something, what do I need? Hypothesis? What? Hypothesis? Hypothesis, no. yes. Before hypothesis. To measure anything, what do I need? Like if I want to measure the, the, the size of my desk. What do we use to measure things? Like a parameter or? And what's the represent? Yeah, it's a pro based on numbers, right? Yeah. Well, we use math. Scientists use math, right? Mm -hmm. Can science prove math? No, how? Because like, can a scientist make up an experiment and we're going to test the number four? But they use the number four to do science, but science can't go back and show us the existence of four, right? Mm -hmm. So this is my example, is that mathematics, we would say it has an objective rules, but that doesn't mean that it has to be physical or that science has to be able to demonstrate it. So Schaefer Landau's point here, if science can prove the existence of mathematics, but it will use mathematics as objective, then why say that right and wrong or good and bad cannot object, cannot exist objectively as well? But they're just not physical in the same way numbers and mathematics are physical, but objective. So this is where it gives us a deep, like, philosophy of mathematics. <laughs> is that, can we say like the number four, and not the symbol or anything, the concept itself, does four need human beings in order to have that value? Imagine all the human beings died on earth. Would four still have the same value? No. Nope. Would two plus two equal four, even if there were no humans? See, this is a deep math, math. Like this is a deep philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. Is math independent of human beings? Is it something that we discover or is it something that we make? And that's essentially, I think, what's going on with the debate of meta ethics as well. Is right or wrong something that we make or is it something that we discover? And so this is why, uh, it was back in 2017, but I think it's still relevant now and it's getting worse, I think maybe. Uh, like, there's a, there was a debate in uh, the New York Times, they had an article where there were some uh, all right protesters uh, going to different uh, universities. And, and there were clashes and protests and there were fights between very racist people who were part of the alt-right and, and there was a, this question, right? Is it okay to punch a Nazi? Is it okay to, to use physical violence against somebody with those views, right? 
and that's an ethical question, right? So for objectivism, they're going to say that there is an answer to this. It doesn't mean that the answer is easy to solve, right? But that there is an objective answer to this, that you can answer moral questions like that, that it is possible. So you see the debate with, going back, the subjectivist, I'm sorry, the objectivist and the nihilist, right? This is where I think the real debate is happening. Are there objective moral standards or facts where we can say it is right or wrong, or is there no such thing as right or wrong? So we saw both sides, and that's why I'm leaving it up to you. And Jeffrey Lando is leaving it up to you to decide what side has the better arguments, what side has better support for their position. So you have to decide. That's why philosophy is difficult. I know. But I would say, really, I would preference that all disciplines are difficult like that. Even if they don't tell you right now as a student, you find out later, no matter what you're studying, that no discipline is easy, right or wrong answers. They're all difficult. Like, I remember my, one of my professors who I took psychobiology with, so we're studying the brain. Like the first day he opens up the textbook, he says, oh, this should have a question mark. We're not 100% sure about any of this. <laughs> But he's very just straightforward and honest about it, right? It's like, this is, remember what I said about science and science textbooks. This is the best that we have. This is the best hypothesis or theory that we have. But we're not 100% certain this is the right answer. So I think all disciplines, if you start digging deep into them, you'll find the same thing that that's why experts disagree. This is why they debate. This is why different doctors, researchers, scientists don't agree on everything. It's a very difficult uh, thing to arise at, at the truth. So that's the foundation for what I was saying about with ethics. So we'll, let me go back to the main. So that's why I decided we start here. What's the foundation? What is right or wrong in the first place? Does it exist or not? From there, we're going to start moving into uh, normative ethics. And this is where we're going to start getting to different ethical theories. Because all these boxes here, all these theories have their own standard of what's right or what's wrong. But we should always question and go back to, well, wait a minute, is there such a thing as right or wrong? Before we start making these judgments. Any final questions? No. Okay. So the applied response, I have the instructions for the applied response on Blackboard. I'm very particular about everything. Um, but I want to see if, if I remember if I put it up here at the very end. I want to go over it, everybody. Um, okay, so the applied response, their first mini essay is this. We talked about Genster's article about cultural relativism and why he says cultural relativism is wrong. And remember, he had four, four main objections, right? Mm -hmm. Against it. What I want you to do in this essay is that I want you to pick two out of the four 
And what you're going to do is you're going to listen to this podcast uh, from this show called Radio Lab. And there's a there's an episode about American football, and it's a two part uh, podcast. So there's two stories. There's a one story in the beginning, and there's a different story at the end. And what I want you to do is explain from the the two that you chose, the two objections you chose. Where do you see the problems that Genser talked about with those objections? Where do you see those in the story in the podcast? How do they relate to what the story was talking about? So remember the problem with subcultures that uh, if you're supposed to follow your culture, but then you have two different cultures tell you two different things, right? Mm -hmm. Which do you follow? Where do you see those kind of scenarios in, in the story? Where okay. do you see those kind of problems in the story? Okay. So what you're going to do, and I, I have a PowerPoint that I posted as well on how to write these mini essays for me. I have like a step-by-step -step guide. Uh, the first thing you should do is first explain and define what the theory is. So we're talking about cultural relativism. Give me the definition, explain, paraphrase, give me in your own words, what is cultural relativism? Because the way I grade is that I'm going to pretend I don't know anything about the subject. So okay. don't assume that, uh, oh, he knows what I'm talking about. Don't, don't assume that. You have to explain everything. So what is, to somebody who's not in the class, you would have to explain, well, what is cultural relativism? What does that mean? What is the okay. thing about? And then you're also going to have to give me a small summary of Gensler's objections, right? So why what is his objection? Explain, because don't assume. Just the, oh, I'm sorry. For the two that we chose, right? Right. So what, okay. are, what, are his, uh, what are these objections mean? What does it have to do with cultural relativism, relatives what you just explained, right? And then give me a summary of the podcast. So that's why I didn't... I'm going to pretend I didn't listen to the podcast. So you're going to have to give me a small summary of what the story was about. Okay. And then at the end, this is where the really real philosophy part happens. Show me the connection between the two. So you explained the paper, then you explained the podcast. And then now in the last part, you can explain well, what, how do they relate? So like I said, right now with the, uh, the subculture issue. It's like, where do you see the problem that Gensler was talking about in the story? Give me examples from the story where it's a problem. So it's kind of like what I was doing in the discussions uh, here. It's like, I, give, I try to give you real life examples of what the book is talking about. So when I make these uh, assignments, I want to see if you understand. And I think part of the best way for me to determine whether you understand is whether you can make those connections and you can give me examples of where you see what they're talking about in the book okay. in real life. So these podcasts are about real life scenarios. They're not just stories. They're actually about like more like documentaries, like interviews with actual real people. Okay. Uh, you do have to cite, though. This is what I put on the bottom there. MLA or APA. You get to pick. MLA is more for liberal arts majors and APA is more for science majors. It doesn't really matter for me which one you pick, but just to let you know. Uh, but you do have to follow the citation. And that means in-text citation. So page numbers, uh, authors, um, with the podcast, you have to cite the podcast as well. So if you say, well, so-and-so said this in the podcast, and you have a quote or something, well, make sure you cite two at the end of that sentence, the okay. podcast. Well, uh, if you're not sure how to cite a podcast, that's why I put that Al Purdue website. 
it, the link there and you can find, or you can just Google as well and see how MLA style, how you cite podcasts and they'll give you examples. And the, the way I'm going to grade uh, the papers is that if I have the old rubric. Uh, so, no, I don't, I don't have it. I'll, I, I have it posted on uh, Blackboard. The rubric, what I, how I grade is that I look at formatting. Did you follow the directions? That's one okay. part. Uh, two is grammar and punctuation. That's important. Okay. especially for philosophy. So make sure you proofread, make sure you did everything correctly. Um, the structure is the third part. You should have a, this is why I also include this in the, in the uh, PowerPoint for how to write a philosophy, uh, applied response. Make sure that the outline follows what I said right now. You explain the theory, uh, you explain the object, uh, you explain, um, sorry, um, the objections and then mm -hmm. the story and then you put that together, right? So make sure you have that order that you're talking about the theory, then you're talking about uh, the story and then you show me at the end how they connect. Okay? okay. I would say that Spend a lot of time on uh, outlining. Students tend to ignore that. The outline is your plan. I was taught outlines are 80% of the work of writing a paper. Because what happens, I've noticed, and this used to happen to me when I was first started college, is I would sit in front of the computer and then I would wait for magic to happen. Like, oh, I'm just going to get all these ideas and it's just going to come out. No, no, no. That's a bad idea. Like, it's a, the analogy I would use is that if you're trying to rub a bank, what should you have first? Uh, know everything about the bank? You should have a plan. This is what's going on. I think when students try to write a paper without an outline, it's like you're trying to run a bank without a plan. You're just going in there and then hoping for the best. It's not a good idea. Okay. Spend time with your outline, like outline it out. The more you outline it, the more time you spend there, the easier it is to write the paper. So the more you lay out, write your steps out, you won't get lost and you'll know exactly where, what you need to write, what you need to talk about. Okay. So plan it out, spend most of your time there and then it shouldn't take too long. The more you plan it out, the easier step forward. Okay. 